Welcome back to our study of Titus. After Paul's initial introduction and comments on his apostleship and Titus, his dear brother of a common faith, now he begins to describe the mission that Titus is going to be on. He says, For this reason I left you in Crete. Paul had just finished with Titus a trip across Crete, so he had a good idea of the of the condition of the churches. He had gone on to Macedonia up in the north that you could review in the historical section of our introduction. He says he's left him now in Crete, and from Macedonia he writes this book back to Titus with the objective of not only giving him directives as to what to do, but primarily to be able to read this in the churches so that people would understand where Titus was coming from and the authority that he had directly from an apostle, which gives us likewise the same kind of authority that as we look at how to structure a church, we should go back and look at these instructions because he says that they should set in order the things that were lacking. Now, these churches, many of them had been in existence for quite a while. We remember in the book of Acts, chapter 2, it says both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, and we hear them speaking in our own languages about the great deeds that God has done. Probably from the, about 32 A.D., now we're at 63 A.D., for 30 years the church has probably been existing, at least groups of believers have been existing, but they evidently had never organized themselves, so he is commissioned to appoint elders in every city. So there evidently were groups of believers in each one of the cities, but that they had never yet organized officially. This is a little different than how he wrote Timothy. When he wrote Timothy, he said in chapter 3, verse 1, he said, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a good work. Those are two very strong words in the Greek with very passionate desire to be responsible for the leaders. You hear this translation calls it the overseer or the bishop, which is the transliteration of the word. Here the word overseer meaning that he is responsible for the lives of other people. What he's finding is the men that he can find not only willing to, but that he can appoint as elders. To even emphasize it more so, that as I commanded you, giving the imperative that churches desperately need the function of an elder in their uh, their leadership role. In fact, we find even in Paul in Acts chapter 14, when he says that when we had preached the gospel in the cities and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to be continue in the faith, saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter into the kingdom of God. Now, this was on his first missionary journey, so now he's returning. And so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The vital necessity of of elders or leaders or pastors, as we'll see, in every church is very important. But the question might be, what are their functions? And so let's look at some of the functions that these men would have. First of all, would be for leadership or direction, because they are there to lead the people. Here's a verse that says in 1 Timothy 5, 17, says that the elders who provide effective leadership must be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard in speaking and teaching. So there we find a number of functions of the leadership. They are to be given double honor, which probably means both respect as well as financial remuneration. But the idea of uh, that leadership and then that they are to be speaking, and we could say this is the same thing as teaching simply because it's the oral ministry of, of the church. Some of their task also is seen in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. It says he gives some apostles and prophets and evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. Equipping has a number of facets. It could also be training. Their aspect is to make sure that the people of the church are able to carry on the ministry and carry on an effective ministry themselves, as well as they're to care. So caring for the flock is another vital part. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you 
watching over it with willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you could get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care. Again, the emphasize assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. There you find another facet of it to be an example. This is one of the reasons for what is going to follow here is a description where they are to be an example. And then if there's anyone among you that is ill, he should summon the elders of the church and they should pray for him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. So especially praying for the sick. Any environment, any culture, any background, uh, there's going to be needy people. One of the greatest testimonies and impacts that people can have is to see that God really answers prayer. Especially when God's people pray, they pray for healing. But I want to see one other thing before we move on, and that is that the term elder has a number of connotations. In this verse, in Acts chapter 20, same context, of Acts 20, verses 17, it says, From Miletus he sent to the Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And then he, as he addresses them, he calls them, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock that is caring for them, watching for them, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And that's the word bishop or overseers. And then he says then to shepherd the flock. It's like the position is that of an overseer, part of the function as well as the, the position. This is the responsibility that the Holy Spirit gives them. And then the office seems to be more of an elder that they call them. But their task is to shepherd or to pastor the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So the first thing we see is that all three terms are used interchangeably in, the, in virtually the same context, but they each one seem to have a little bit different aspect of the ministry that is to be fulfilled by this selecting of these elders. Of course, the real key to it is this verse. It says, remember your leaders and who spoke to you God's message and reflect on the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. It is vitally important, not only their speaking ability, but the imitatableness, if you can call it that, of their faith. That is, as they have put their faith, that produces godliness. Faith is not ever by itself. It's always a initiation of a transformed life. That's where Paul is going to be moving now as he goes through this next passage. Now, these are going to be the kind of things that should be different in his life that they're to imitate. First of all, he is to be blameless, meaning that no one can bring him under some kind of an accusation. This is primarily the idea of the uh, integrity of the office or of the position of the leadership so that the church gains respect because of the leader. But he's to be the husband of one wife. You can also say that this is the one woman man. doesn't necessarily require that he be married because many married people may not have children. And you can't say that you, if you don't have children you, or marriage, you can't be a pastor or a leader. But these are the primary signs of how to know about a person's uh, leadership ability is going to be through his family. This is the closest and most intimate group that is around him. And if you want to be able to ascertain his leadership ability, first you want to look at, the, at his relationship with his wife and how solid that is, and then his relationship with his children. In fact, the children, and naturally assume the wife, are to be faithful. And the word faithful, it comes from the same word as faith, and it means that either believing children or obedient children or faithful or church Christ followers, but they're noted as Christian children and that they're not accused, that is, they don't have a reputation of either dissipation, which is the same word as, as the prodigal son. We would probably just say wild. They're not wild children and they're not insubordinate. And that primarily means the idea of rebellion. And so they're not rebellious, but they respond to discipline. And that is important because if his leadership has been such in the family, then he will be likewise that kind of a leader in the church. However a person leads in his family and whatever respect people have in his family for the father, this is the way it's going to be likewise in, in the church. Now, this whole concept of changed, transformed person is not accidental. And it's very intentional. And all of these that we're going to describe are because 
There's a p passage in Peter, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. These are going to be, all of these concepts, they are to add to their faith. The objective is that the Christian life is not just believing in Christ, but it's trusting in everything that he says and that he says to the church. And as we trust in everything he says to the church, including this passage, then we understand that our Christian life only begins with faith, and that's enough to give perfect, full acceptance before God, but that it continues into a transformed life to become like Christ. It doesn't secure our salvation, doesn't make us more saved than we were when we put our trust in Christ. It just simply means that now that we are completely accepted by God through Christ, now we want to become like Christ. Peter lists these areas. He says you're with every effort, not accidental and is not mystical. It's a very determined, disciplined effort to add to your faith excellence. The whole idea of excellence has to do with the choices that we make as well as then the knowledge that we're to add. That is the knowledge that we gain from scriptures so that we're thinking right, we're thinking biblically. And then self-control, which we'll mention later. And to self-control, we add perseverance. That is patience, being willing to trust and wait and for God's leading. And godliness, that is where we become like God in every aspect. And brotherly affection, that is that we really care about other people from our heart. And then unselfish love, where we live to make a difference in people's lives as we serve them by serving other people and meeting their needs, both spiritually and every other way that we can holistically, we serve Christ. That the whole key to why the emphasis on the family is that if someone does not know how to manage his household, how will he care for the church of God? And he will care for it the same way. If he can't manage his home, he will not manage the church. Then he goes on and he uses now another term, so we have bishop and elder in this passage. And again, as we've mentioned before, these are two synonymous terms that we've seen. They just interchangeably uh, go back and forth. But he must be blameless as a steward of God. And steward, likewise, comes right out of this family focus. Is a word means a household manager. And so he's willing to take care of the family of God. And how he takes care of his own family is going to indicate exactly how he's going to take care of the family of God. So he must be blameless. I mean, he must be seen as no one accuses him of self-interest, but just is selflessly willing to serve others' needs. He's not self-willed. That is, he's not focused on his own agenda, but he's got the heart and the mind of the people and to meeting their needs. Uh, he's not quick-tempered. This comes out of, of course, James talks about that the human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Anger is a serious problem with some men, and you don't want to uh, put men into the leadership that have a problem with anger. They're not given to wine. A little, literal meaning not given means alongside. So you have a, a bottle of water here, and you've got somebody who's standing alongside the, this glass of wine, for a long time, meaning they're drinking a lot. The notion is that he is a drinker and will lose his wisdom. That's exactly what Proverbs tells us, that wine produces mockers. Alcohol leads to brawls. Those led astray by drink cannot be wise. So you're not uh, very smart in, in electing someone or appointing someone to be a leader who has a problem with drinking of wine. And he's not violent. As we just saw, wine can lead to violence. So he makes this connection here too. That he's not a fighter, quarrelsome, or constantly defending himself, not defensive. You can talk to him and he doesn't retaliate. And not greedy for money. Uh, not after the desire to gain things because of his position. But he's also hospitable. That is, he's, the word literally means a lover of strangers. He's willing to invite people to come into his home. Remember a church in 
that I visited once, and uh, a person asked us to come over to his home for dinner the first time we visited the church. And I thought that was really remarkable. And he said that's his ministry of hospitality. He just loves to show people uh, care and invite. Every Sunday he invites someone over to his home. But in a day when you were traveling and you needed places to stay, that's what this is about. So he's a lover of what is good and noted for this, that his choices are wise and good, commendable, uh, both financially, personally, uh, music, aspects of his activities. He just loves what is good. Sober-minded is just simply a term referring to serious. He understands the issues of life and that things need to be taken very seriously. Likewise, he is a just person. And one of the ways to discover uh, a just person is give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. So one of the symptoms you want to look at is how does he learn? Is, is, is he, does he believe he's got all the answers, or is he constantly learning? Holy. This reminds us of Peter's challenge. But uh, like the Holy, the Holy One who called you, become holy yourselves in all your conduct. And the idea of holiness is being set apart for God, that your activities and your life is set apart for His purpose. And then self-controlled. The concept of self-control means that you, you don't lash out in your temper or you're violent but you're patient in understanding the situation. So you're self-controlled. You're not reactionary, but you're proactive in, in precluding problems instead of reacting to them. And then the final one is to hold fast to the faithful word. Now what's kind of interesting is you have five vices here, along with the family, seven virtues that are to be characteristics. And like we've mentioned before, and with Peter, these are to be added, some of them eliminated perhaps from your character. And then seven here are to be added to your, to your, your reputation and your character and, and the way you respond to things. But the last one here, holding fast to the faithful word, is someone who heeds it and listens to it. But primarily the idea of heeding it, you respond to it, you obey it, you obe whatever it says. You take it without arguing. When Jesus taught us that we were to be teaching all things that he has commanded us. In other words, we're to be teaching the commands and we hold fast to the faithful word so that we put it into practice. Notice here he says, as he's been taught, Titus is to go looking across the island for the men that have already been taught They're maybe 30 years into the their walk with the Lord from the time of Pentecost, the way that they have been taught. And so certainly members of the church are to be taught well so that they can defend the faith. That's exactly what it talks about in this passage where he says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So the goal of all of the men in the church should be to be, first of all, or considered as a faithful person. And by faithful, we mean trusting in everything that God says, from salvation to Christian life. That there's really no distinction between how we trust God for salvation and how we trust Him for all the instructions that He's given us for how to live. And the model we have is is Ezra in the Old Testament. He says, Now Ezra had dedicated himself to the study of the law of the Lord and to, to its observance and to teaching its statutes and judgments in Israel. Now that primarily is a, the priority of this person that they're looking for is someone who studies the scriptures so that they can obey it, so that he can obey everything that's written that he discovers in the scriptures. That's what the idea of observance is. And then once he has observed it, practiced it, put it into practice in his life, that then he can focus on teaching its statutes or directives or commands and judgments in Israel. And so that's the process, is to dedicate yourself to learning it and then practicing it. Then you have a platform that people will listen to you for teaching it.
These are the kind of men that he's looking for. Because he must be able to, by sound doctrine, that's healthy doctrine, not twisting it or perverting it, but sound, both to exhort and to convict. And exhort is to point out as wrong, that is to point your finger at what is wrong, and then to convict is to correct and to not only point out a problem, but to show that they are in error, and particularly those who contradict the truth of the Apostle Paul. And the reason he knows that this is going to happen, because he tells them in, about the church in Ephesus, he says, I know that after I am gone, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Even from among your own group, men will arise, teaching perversions, that is, they'll be twisting the scriptures to make them say what they're not saying, teaching perversions of the truth to draw the disciples away after them. That's their primary motive, not to build people up, but to draw them away and form a separate and promote their own group. Now, the description of who these people are is what we're going to be talking about next. So in our next study, we will go through a description of how and who these people are.